Welcome everybody to Inspirited Live. I'm John Spellman, and tonight we're going to be talking about Jeremiah, uh, specifically the last five kings of Judah. So before we begin anything, let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opportunity that we can come together to study your word. Bless us, Lord, as we study these lessons and learn how they can apply to our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how you can participate in tonight's program. So I want to start off by reading um, Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 16. This week we're talking again about the book of Jeremiah. That's what we're studying this quarter. And we're talking about particularly the last five kings of Judah and what we can learn from their experience that might help us today. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know, to know me, saith the Lord? So here God says, okay, judging the poor and the needy, isn't, this the, isn't, isn't that act an example of knowing God? Uh, so God basically equates caring for those who are defenseless, those who are poor, those who are needy, with having a knowledge of him. So um, you'll remember that uh, in 1 John, the Bible says that God is love. And um, we see that in the last days when Jesus talks about uh, the judgment and how people will be separated in the day of judgment, uh, you have the sheep that are separated from the goats. You have those who are on the right hand, those who are on the left hand. And one of the major differences between them is when Jesus talks about how I was in prison and you visited me. I was, um, you know, hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. So these examples show that we have a knowledge of God. Um, whereas those who don't participate and don't do those things... Uh, he says, depart from me, I never knew you. So it's, 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 it's a, a statement that pretty much says that the person never had, uh, the, the person never had an intimate knowledge uh, of Jesus. The person uh, is as good as having never met him before. So uh, if we truly know God, then we should demonstrate our knowledge of God through the way that we love one another. Um, let me just grab the text from 1 John. I think that will kind of... Um, add to our discussion here. So if you go to 1 John chapter 2, it says, But whosoever keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. So how did Jesus walk? Um, one of the ways in which he walked was by caring for those um, who were in need. And so if we're going to walk the way that Jesus walked, then the same care and compassion that he had is, is care and compassion that we also should have. Another text that I'll bring out that kind of uh, adds to that, uh, 1 John chapter 4, and I'm starting at verse 7. And it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. If you, if you look at that, it tells us that basically when we love one another, then we've had an experience with God. We know God. But those who don't love, those who don't show care and compassion for others, especially the less fortunate, really don't know God at all. Um, and it says, and the reason for that, it says here, is that God is love. And so if we don't show care and concern and love for those who are less fortunate, then we can't possibly know who God really is. We may have heard things about God, but we don't necessarily know God. One of the problems with the kings of Judah um, was that no matter how wrong they were, uh, they seemed to never believe that they were doing the wrong thing. They never understood that they were polluted, that they were um, in apostasy. They thought that they were doing everything right and that God was on their side. And so, in a sense, we could say that they were blind, um, choosing not to see. Uh, they didn't want uh, this knowledge that they were in the wrong. And when the, pro when the prophets would come and, and rebuke them, they often rejected their messages. And so uh, each of the kings basically inwardly considered themselves to be in the right, and didn't want to hear that they were wrong. So first we're going to talk about the rule of uh, Josiah. And I'd like us to start off, uh, basically I'll give you a little bit of background on Josiah. Uh, Josiah was the 16th king to rule in the southern kingdom. So you'll remember that due to um, rebellion uh, on the part of Rehoboam, the, the kingdom was split, and uh, you had the northern tribes, which were Israel, and then the southern kingdoms, which were uh, Judah. And um, 
Josiah's reign spanned from about 640 to 609 BC, and he became uh, king at the age of eight. But unlike many of the other kings that we were discussing last week, Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and which is really interesting because his father and his grandfather uh, were, were kings that did wicked, but yet somehow Josiah stands out from them and chooses to do what's right. Um, so Josiah's reign, because of his uh, choice to do the right thing, lasted for about 31 years. And unlike his ancestors, uh, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Uh, you'll see that in 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 2. Let me take a comment coming in by phone. Yes, John, it's interesting about Josiah. King of Josiah, he was placed on the, as you mentioned, he was placed on the, on the throne at the age of eight. That's right. But it was eight years later when he actually started his revival, reformation. And it's interesting that speculation, what was going on from the time that he was eight up until eight years later, he, the time he was 16. Apparently, he was involved in Bible study. He mm -hmm. was involved in prayer. He was developing into the young man uh, that was going to follow the Lord. As you mentioned, his father was Ammon. Mm -hmm. Ammon was one of the worst kings in the history of Judah. Yes, he was. His grandfather was Manasseh. His grandfather was Manasseh. King Manasseh, he was so evil and so corrupt that during his reign, Judah was doing worse things than the heathens of Canaan. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that King Josiah, who had a father who was corrupt, who had a grandfather was corrupt. Josiah recognized that there is a God that, that the nation should follow him, and not only did he follow the Lord, but he encouraged and got the people of the nation to follow the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'll listen. Thank you. I want to go through uh, some of Josiah's uh, specific reforms so we can look at uh, how his character shaped the uh, the nation itself. Um, so if we turn to uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 34, um, it tells us the story of Josiah and what he did. And uh, like what was said, uh, Josiah started his reign when he was eight, and he reigned for, uh, for 31 years. Um, now, if you look at verse 4, it tells you some of the things. Actually, no, we'll, we'll even start with, uh, with verse 3, and it starts to tell us some of the things that he did. So it says, for an eighth year of his reign... So he's eight years old and he's also in the eighth year of his reign. Uh, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God, uh, f after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and, and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. So here it shows us that he begins his reform by first seeking the Lord. And so this kind of gives us a hint at what we can do when we want to start a reform within us. Uh, whether it's a personal reform, whether it's a reform within our church, whether it's a reform in our community, the first step in any reform is to seek the Lord. And then after he began seeking the Lord, um, he, it says that he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places, the groves, the carved images, and the molten images. So he began seeking the Lord and then excluding all other options. So he, as he sought the Lord, he got rid of all the false gods. Then in verse 4 it says, And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence, and the images that were on high that were on high above them. He cut down, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images, he break in pieces, and made dust of them, and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon, the, upon their altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So we're seeing like a real sign of repentance here. You know, instead of continuing on the same path as, that his ancestors were on, uh, Josiah makes a real turnaround and gets rid of the very things that were bringing about the destruction of, on Jerusalem uh, that had caused God to forsake his people because of how they were basically embarrassing him in front of the other nations. So you'll remember that we talked about last week that God had to punish the children of Israel um, or in this case Judah, uh, but Israel as well, he had to punish his people because if he allowed his people to continue down a path doing the same abominations that the heathens did 
and he showed them favor while he destroyed the heathens, then the heathens would say, hey, you know, God is partial. Look at the things that he does. You know, we do the same things and he destroys us, but yet he seems to have favor on them. So the disobedience and the rebellion put God in a place where he had to punish his own people, just as he would punish any nation participating in and doing any of those things. But yet, um, we find that in the case of Judah, God didn't make a full end. Uh, he allowed them to continue on so that he could fulfill his promise. And uh, later on, uh, we'll see how the Messiah was brought forth out of the kingdom of Judah. He, he began in Jerusalem. He did the same thing in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and, and, uh, and Simon, even unto Naphtali, uh, with their maddox round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and, and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and, and uh, Meiziah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of jo Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. Now that part's significant, because as we see in, in verse 8, after he began tearing down the images and the, the false houses of worship, he began to set up the true house of worship. So instead of just uh, leaving it waste, he builds it up again. So it seems like everything that they had done wrong in the past, Josiah is basically re uh, reversing it. Uh, in verse 9 it says, And when they came to Hilkiah, the, the high priest, they delivered the, the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites had kept the doors, sorry, uh, which Levites that kept the doors had gathered on, of, of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and of all the remnant of Israel, and of all Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house. So we see here that the house of, uh, that the house of God is now being rebuilt. Now I'm going to skip down a couple of verses. Uh, we're skipping down to verse 14. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and, and said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king, uh, the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. So as they, I see we got a comment coming in by webcam. I'll take it in one moment. Um, as, as, they, uh, brought the house, uh, the, uh, as they brought the book of the law to uh, the king, Josiah, he read the book. And as he began to read the book, he saw how God had said that as long as they followed and kept his commandments, they would be blessed. But then God lists specifically all the curses that would follow because of disobedience. And I, I can imagine that as Josiah began to read all these curses in, in its explicit and specific detail, he realized as he looked around that that's exactly word for word what was happening and what had happened to Judah. And so Josiah... Um, tears his clothes as he realizes, wow, God fulfilled exactly what he said he was going to do if people were disobedient. All right, so I'm going to uh, take the comment. Well, um, I want to say that, you know, one of the things of the punishment of the kings, some of the king, last kings of Judah, one of the, one of the things about the punishment was God was using it redemptively to try to save them in some way, any possible way. He was, Jesus was using, uh, no, he was leaving no stone unturned, un, uncovered to be able to save mankind. And he was trying to save those kings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would, and I say, I bring it to Hebrews 12, chapter 12, verse 6. It says, and scourges every son whom he receives. So God, God, um, God actually punishes his children so that he can, so that he can actually save them. Mm -hmm. And he has a redemptive purpose in punishing. And then, so, but ho for us today, hopefully, we'll trust in God like Jeremiah and Josiah did, so that we'll have a deep relationship with the Lord, so that we won't have to be uh, punished in a great measure. Amen. You know, uh, that's that's very true. Now, I'm going to actually look at um, a couple more verses in Second Chronicles uh, chapter 34. And it says here, 
um, that Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and ah ah Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and the and Abna, sorry, and Abdon, the son of uh, Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah, uh, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in, in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. So here, clearly, he's, um, he sees that there's a connection between all the events that have happened to them and the wrath of God being poured out. And so he asks his, his, uh, his subjects to go and to inquire of the Lord to find out what can be done about this. Now, I think there's a, a lesson in that for us today in that um, God has told us about the events and the particulars of what will happen in the last days. And so when we see things beginning to come to pass, it's not a sign of discouragement. Because, I mean, um, Josiah could have looked at this and looked at all the things that were going on around them and said, ah, you know, our, our city is desolate, you know, the, the Babylonians are taken over, ne we have to pay tribute to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, all, everything's going wrong, maybe there is no God, you know, maybe, maybe, there's, uh, maybe we should get, abandon him completely and just do whatever the Babylonians want. He could have taken that attitude. But instead, we find that he makes a connection between the words of God in the book of the law, as was written by Moses, and their current situation. Isn't it true that we could take the Bible today and look at the world around us and see fulfillment of prophecy, see fulfillment in the very things that God said was going to happen in our time? And instead of uh, us having excuse not to believe, it would actually give us a greater reason to believe because we see that God's word is coming to pass. And that's what Josiah saw when he, when the book of the law was read uh, before him. So he has uh, his people to go in and to inquire of the Lord. And um, he sends them uh, to, a, to a prophet. And uh, verse 22 tells us, And Hilkiah and they that, uh, that the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of uh, Tikvath, the son of, of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the, in the college, and they spake to her to that effect. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that, uh, that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book which they have read before the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the words, with all the works of their, of their hands, therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place, and shall not be quenched. And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel concerning the words which thou hast heard. Because thine heart was tender, and thou, hast, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against, his, against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes, and weep before me, I, even I, heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace, neither shall thine, thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, and upon the inhabitants of, of the same. So they brought the king word again. Okay? Looks like we got a comment coming in by webcam, so we'll go ahead and grab that before I uh, comment further on those on those verses. Well, I wanted to make the point from Second Chronicles chapter 34, and that's a big chapter, but the key, uh, key verse is in verse 8, to, they, mm -hmm. they began to repair the temple, the house of the Lord his God, and when they, did, when they started doing that, when they started seeking the Lord and repairing the temple, mm -hmm. then you see in verse um, verse 14, Hilkiah the priest, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law. He found the book of the law of the, of the Lord given by Moses. So, you know, they were basically, they found the book of the law, and with the book of the law, they knew what to do. They knew, they knew, they, it revealed how they could follow the Lord better. And so we need the Bible. We need this 
true, pure, holy, and righteous book. We need this book, and we need it in our lives. We need to chew on it and, and you know, and think about it and um, believe it with our whole heart. Amen. Just like they did. Amen. You know, and that and that's the key. You know, if we don't really focus and 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 uh, take heed to what God is saying to us in His Word then uh, we can be in danger of doing the same things that uh, they did in, in, in Josiah's time, or actually really before Josiah, and uh, again after Josiah, in that when we forsake the word of the Lord um, and we continue on a path of rebellion, then you know things begin to happen and it gets worse and worse and worse as God's wrath is poured out. But uh, if we would humble ourselves before God, see, what I, what I, what's interesting about Josiah's reign is that God doesn't bring the evil that's, that he's going to bring on the nations during Josiah's time. Instead, he preserves Josiah, he allows him to reign, and then after his 31 years of reigning, uh, God puts him to sleep before he, um, b before he plans to uh, execute judgment on the nations. Because Israel and Judah had, had pretty much determined to do wrong. So, Judah, so Israel was punished first uh, by the Assyrians, and now Judah, they were following down the same path, doing the same exact thing, and so God... Um, had to punish them because even with uh, Josiah reigning, after him another king would come and do wickedly and send them right back on the path to doing the wrong thing that they were doing in the first place that got them in trouble. So they were clearly unrepentant. For a while they did what Josiah wanted just because he was the king at the time, but you know, after the fact, that repentance did not remain. Um, and so we find that uh, God has no other choice but to punish them, but instead of allowing Josiah to see that happen, he puts him to sleep. Might it be true that even in the last days that we're living in right now, that some people might be put to sleep rather than see some of the things that are going to come upon this world because of the wickedness that people do? Just uh, food for thought. So they inquire of the prophet, um, and then they began to man uh, and then Josiah began to mandate that all of God's laws in his kingdom be followed. So uh, we see all these reforms that he makes. First, he, um, he seeks after God. He gets rid of uh, all the false gods. <laughs> he has the house of the Lord rebuilt. Um, he finds the book of the law. Um, he seeks after a prophet to, uh, I guess, add some commentary or to give them some idea of what they should do and inquire of the Lord what should be done. And then after he inquires of the Lord, he mandates that all of God's laws in his kingdom be followed. So we see an act of true revival uh, during Josiah's time. And so uh, the evil that was going to come upon the nation didn't come until after Josiah's reign when, he's, when he sleeps with his fathers. Let me just find the verse again. Okay, if you look at verse uh, 28, it says, Behold, I, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall, thy, sh shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. Uh, so they brought word to the king again. So um, later on when Josiah actually dies, you know, usually the term that, that was used when the king died was that they, they sleep with their fathers. Um, and what's interesting about that is that for the righteous, death is nothing but a sleep. Uh, because we have hope in the resurrection, in the first resurrection in particular, in which all that are in the graves will hear God's voice and will come up out of the graves and reign with him forever. And so for, jo for someone like Josiah, death was just a sleep and God preserved him or, or, and is still preserving him um, until he returns uh, to judge the world. So in verse 31, after all this is, is said to Josiah, when they, when they bring him back word of what uh, God has said through this prophet, the Bible tells us that the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests, and the Levites, and all the people, great and small, and he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. And he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertained to the children of Israel and, and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Now that 
is what I call reform. Let's take a comment coming in. Thanks for having me on the program, John. I like all the preaching here. And uh, this is Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 33. And in there, there's a key verse that helps us know about salvation and about Jesus. And it's um, it says, in Israel, partway down the verse, it says, in Israel, diligently, okay, there we go. All who were present in Israel diligently served the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. So they diligently followed the Lord. They didn't, right. ser they didn't serve him here a little and not, and serve him a little bit and not. They served him, their, their whole heart was in it, and they diligently served the Lord. And that's what we must do. We, we must serve the Lord diligently. Mm -hmm. In order to, um, resp well, it's really responding to the love God has given us. And so, and um, the last key verse that I wanted to share in, in right now is in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses um, 13 and 14. And you will seek me and find me mm -hmm. when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I'll bring you back from your captivity. So maybe today, dear brothers and sisters, people, dear people, you might be suffering and you might be captive, captive to in prison. You might be captive to your own uh, sins. You might be captive to your own sins, but Jesus is able to unshackle you and keep you unshackled. He's able to do that. And and he was te and Jeremiah. This message was to God's people in captivity in Jeremiah 29. It was to God's people in captivity. So it's to us in captivity. God is giving us great hope. I'll listen. Amen. You know, and there is great hope, um, you know, especially when we follow God's will. And, uh, you know, it's like you said, you know, we can't turn to the right hand or to the left. We have to follow um, God's laws with our whole heart. And, you know, if we obey God with our whole heart uh, and we seek him, you know, we will find him. Um, a few other things I wanted to bring out about Josiah before I move on to the other four kings are that, you know, for one thing, Josiah was one person that made such a huge reform and a huge impact on, on Judah. Um, and so it shows that we can never really underestimate the power or the influence of one person. Uh, whereas uh, all those around him were bowing down to these images and doing, choosing to do the wrong thing. Here, the king stands up and says, you know what, we're not going to do this anymore. And, you know, that makes me think about our, po our, our politicians and our, our political leaders. Because a lot of times when they get pressure from the outside, uh, pressure from political parties or pressure from... Um, special interest groups or uh, pressure from people who are rich, you know, they fold under that pressure and they do what they think um, their funders or their um, con constituents or, you know, the majority want them to do. But here, Josiah stood up at a time when it was popular to do wrong and he chose to do what was right and mandate that everybody follow it. And when he did, um, he caused a great reform to come upon the land of Judah and really made a difference for doing what's right. And God blessed him. And so it shows us that, uh, you know, even in the most challenging circumstances, uh, when God blesses us with a certain level of power or influence or uh, position, that we should always use that position or that power or that influence to do what is right, because you never know the impact you might have. Suppose Josiah decided to, um, you know, yield to the temptation or to the peer pressure around him. Uh, you know, he, you know, the, the, the captivity of Judah might have happened a whole lot sooner, maybe even during his reign. But instead, because he stood up for truth and he was, he was able to make a difference, and if the people had only continued on the path that he set them on, um, you know, perhaps the captivity might not have needed to happen. You could be in a situation where, you know, maybe you're not a person of, of, of any particular uh, amount of power or position, but if somebody like Josiah could make a difference, maybe you in your own context that God has placed you in can, can make a difference where you are. And God may be using you uh, and, and, and may need you to stand firm rather than yield to the temptations around you. Uh, so we see here that one person can have such a huge impact and uh, you know, really change the course of, of history. And Josiah did that. I see that we got a comment coming in by phone, so I'll go ahead and grab that. Yes, John, it's interesting that you're getting into the other kings as well. Um, 
I read something interesting in the companion book concerning the, the last four kings. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a direct correlation between them and the parable that Jesus mentioned in Matthew chapter 13. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and listen as you continue to talk about these kings. But it's interesting also that Josiah was an excellent king, even though toward the end of his life he made a foolish decision. But the rest of the kings, those the last four, all of them, thumbs down. Bad news, bad news, bad news. They just continue to go deeper and deeper into sin to the point where the Babylonians came in and we know the history of that. I'll listen. Thank you. So, as we continue this, we're looking at the uh, the next group of kings, and, uh, you know, like Patrick wrote out, you know, uh, they, they just started getting worse and worse, and, you know, it seems like the, the, the reforms that Josiah brought about, the people are going right back to doing what they were doing in the first place, which got them in trouble. Now, you would think that after the reading of the law and all these things that, um, you know, they were now seeing and, and, and seeing a direct correlation between how um, there were these judgments in the book of, 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 uh, of the law, the book that, uh, that Moses had written, and, and then uh, their experience and what they were seeing happen. And you would think that they would say, okay, let's not do this again because we don't want these things to happen. But no, they go right back to it. Uh, so we're, we're going to look at the next two kings, which are uh, Jehoaz and Jehoiakim. Jehoaz was also known as uh, Shalom, and he was uh, 23 years old when he succeeded his father, uh, and that his father, of course, was Josiah. Um, and his reign lasted about three months. And then Pharaoh replaced him with his brother, Jehoiakim, because Jehoaz was not favorable toward Egyptian po uh, politics. So Jehoaz was taken from Egypt and... Um, Sorry, taken to Egypt, rather, and there, and there he died. Let's take a look at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem, and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And Necho uh, took Jehoaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. Uh, now let's go to 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 31 to 34. And it says, Jehoaz was twenty and three years old, when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was uh, Hamatal, and the daughter, sorry, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bands at, at Riblah, in the land of, of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and put the land to a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a, and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah, his father, and turned his, his name to Jehoiakim, and took Je Jehoaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. So that tells us how uh, Jehoiakim came to reign. But notice what we see here, that Jehoaz did evil in the sight of the Lord, and within three months God had already removed him from office and put um, um, Josiah's other son, to reign. Now, if we take a look at um, Jehoiakim's reign, he reigned from about 609 to about 598 BC. And, it, and we find that uh, when by the time that Nebuchadnezzar had taken over Jerusalem, that Jehoiakim was taken to Babylon along with the vessels from the temple. So let's turn uh, to Jeremiah chapter 22 and let's see what Jeremiah says about these things. Now, Jeremiah is talking particularly here to uh, Jehoiakim. And so God gives him. God gives Jeremiah this warning message to give to Jehoiakim that he might repent. But let's see what happens. All right. So we start off with verse 1, and Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord God, Go down to the house of, of the king of Judah and speak there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David, thou thy servants and thy people that enter, into the, in, that enter in by, the, by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, Execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, to the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. For if ye do this in this thing indeed, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house kings sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots on and on horses, he and his servants and his people. But if ye will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. For thus saith the Lord unto the kings of the house of Judah, Thou art Gilead unto me, and the head of Lebanon. 
Yet surely I will make thee a wilderness and cities which are not inhabited. And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapons. And they shall cut down the, the, the choice setters and cast them into the fire. And many nations shall pass by this city, and they shall say every man to his neighbor, Wherefore hath the Lord done th thus unto this great city? Then they shall answer, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God, and worshipped other gods, and served them. Weep ye not for the dead, neither be bemoan that him. But weep sore for him that goeth away, for he shall return no more, nor, nor see his native country. For thus saith the Lord, touching Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which re resigned instead of Josiah his father, which went forth out of, his, out of this place, he shall not return thither any more. But he shall die in the place wh whither they have led him captive, and shall see this land no more. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work, that saith, I will build me a wide house, and large chambers, and cutteth him out windows, and it sealed, and it sealed with setter, and painted with, with vermilion. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in setter? Did not thy father eat and drink, and do judgment and justice, and then it was well with him? He judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well with him. Was not this to know, to know me, saith the Lord? So here we see that phrase again, to know me. So to take care of the, the poor, to take care of those who are needy, not to oppress people who work for you. All these things are equated with the knowledge of God. And people who don't practice these things, even if they're religious and they attend the temple, um, don't really know God. So today that kind of sends us a loud message that there can be some of us who go to church on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis or however often a person might go, but they might not really know God because they're practicing the very things that God is against. So for God, he says here that to know him is to actually obey and do the things that he would want us to do. And if we oppress people and we treat them poorly, uh, we don't really know God, regardless of how many times we might attend the temple. Here, God makes a strong case that they had seen how, uh, Jehoiakim had seen how uh, Shalom was punished and, and, and taken off the throne when he began to rebel against God. But Josiah, who did what was right in the sight of the Lord, began to reign. So all, Je all, all Jehoiakim would have to do is just simply obey God, and he would see the blessings that his father saw. But instead, he seems to ignore this and to continue doing wickedly. Uh, so we got a comment coming in by phone, so let me go ahead and grab it. This is in the companion book by uh, uh, Brother Golden, Timothy Joseph Golden. He talks about what you just said about the people knowing God, and even today, people knowing God. And... We, we, we hear that expression, knowing God, but I like the way um, uh, Brother Golden mentioned it in the companion book. Mm -hmm. The people during the time of Judah, they knew God. They had knowledge of God. But you've already qualified that by stating that it's about obedience as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. But it's about obedience, knowing God with the right motive. It's got to be in the heart. See, they were, the Jews, they were going to the temple. They knew about Jehovah. They went through the ritual of the behavior which was expected, but it was a name for it. It wasn't in their heart. It wasn't a part of them. It was all a form of godliness, but denying the power of it. Right. Today, is it possible to see that same type of mindset, that same type of behavior in our churches today? Mm -hmm. When the Babylonians came, in conquered Jerusalem, there were Jews running into the temple thinking that the temple itself was going to save them. That's right. It did not save them. The temple was destroyed. The same with 70 AD when the Romans came and destroyed the temple that was rebuilt. The people thought the temple was going to save them. Mm -hmm. Today, the church does not save us. Attending church does not save us. What saves us is our personal relationship with the Lord between the truth and his word prayerfully <clears throat> when there's a heart change and it's so sad to think that many of us today Christians across the planet are thinking that if they just go into that building of brick and mortar then somehow they have connected with God no that connection of the Lord starts with a personal relationship with truth and his word through prayer 
church, going to church is not the end to a means, it's a means to the end. The end is having a relationship with the Lord. I'll listen. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you hit the, the nail right on the head because, I mean, it, it, it's about that personal relationship. And, you know, these scriptures are clear that you don't have that personal relationship if you're practicing all the things that God says not to do. And so it's a message for us. I mean, there's some people who have one foot in the church and one foot outside the church where they're doing all the things that God says not to do, but then think that they're still saved and that they have a, a relationship with God. I mean, you know, you got people who, you know, go clubbing uh, after church or even before church or, you know, they curse in the parking lot of the church and they do all kinds of things, but yet because they come in and they prayed and maybe they sang a couple songs and they threw themselves around the place, you know, they, they think that, they, that that's a relationship. And God says that to know him, is to put into practice um, not oppressing uh, those uh, you know who, who work for them, not oppressing the poor, uh, giving uh, what you have to, the, to those who are in need, executing judgment and justice. Those are what a person does when they really know God. And if a person does not do those things, then they really don't know God. Well, I want to say thank you, John, for having Jesus into the study. And um, one of the things is... Uh, there's a problem with why these, one of the reasons why these kings, you like, would ask the question, like, why did these kings, if they had the, if they had Josiah's example, if they had Jeremiah's example, if they had those people that were dealing, dealing with the money, their faithfulness, what, if they had all these examples of faithfulness, what, why, why did they turn away from God? Why did they not do his will? Why did they seek disobedience instead? And why did they sin? And one of, the, one of the reasons is, is because they could not, they could not save themselves. And they were, they were selfish. They wanted to do their own will. You know, some people, they, they just want to do their own thing. They want, they want their own, they don't, they want their own way. And so that, that's just, that's just so, that's just so what, rebellious. And that's why it's like, it separates them from Christ. They they can't see. They can't find Jesus because they don't want to find Jesus. They don't want to submit to Him. And I want to bring a Bible text out real quick mm -hmm. from First Peter chapter one verse twenty three. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we're, if we're born again. We're born again through the word, and the word is true, and the word saves completely. Amen. Amen. Actually, scripture kind of brings out this point with what in particular was wrong with Jehoiakim. Because in, in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 17, God already seems to know that Jehoiakim is not going to listen. He says here, but thine eyes and thine heart are, are not but for thy covetousness, and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression and for violence to do it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or Ah, my, ah sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or Ah, his glory. He shall be buried with, his, with, with the burial of a donkey, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of, of Jerusalem. So here... Jo uh, Jehoiakim's reign is not going to end well. Now I'd like us to go on to um, the next king, which is Jehoiachin. And his reign was a short reign. So in the 19th, uh, the 19th king of Judah was Jehoiachin, uh, son of Jehoiakim, and he, in, he reigned on David's throne for barely three and a half months. And in uh, 598 BC, Nebuchadnezzar brought his forces to Jerusalem and seized the 18-year-old with his mom uh, and his wives and all the royal uh, captives. In uh, 561 BC, the 13th, uh, sorry, the 37th year of his of his captivity, Jehoiachin was given mercy by uh, evil uh, Merodach, and Nebuch uh, who was Nebuchadnezzar's successor, and he was granted the right to dine with the king of Babylon, and he could uh, wear his kingly robes. So, <coughs> so let's go to. Uh, 2 Kings, we'll see the story in 2 Kings chapter 25. We're going to start at verse 27. And it came to pass in the 7th and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and the 12th month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, that evil Mor uh, Morodach, king of Babylon, in the year that uh, he, he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, out of, out of prison. And he spake kindly to him, 
and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in, ba in Babylon. And he changed his prison garments, and he did eat bread continually before him all the days of his life. And his allowance was continual allowance given him of the king a daily rate for every day all the days of his life. Now we're going to go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 52, 31. And it says, And it came to pass in the seventh and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month and the fifth and twentieth day of, his, of the month, the evil Moradah king of, of Babylon in the first year of his reign lifted up the head of, uh, of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of the prison, and spake kindly to, unto him, and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon. So here we see pretty much the same thing that, uh, you know, Jehoiachin receives uh, a degree of favor. And then as we read down to uh, verse 33, it says, and, he, and changed his prison garments, and he did continually eat bread before him all the days of his life. And for his diet, there was continual diet given him of the king of Babylon, every day a portion until the day of his death, all the days of his life. So we see here how uh, Jehoiachin's reign didn't last too long. And again, it's because he departed from the words of the Lord, and the Lord caused him to go into captivity. So it's it's like, you know, we're seeing that God's promise that uh, the nation would be brought into captivity isn't going to even come into pass right away. He's, he's being patient. He's allowing this thing to play out over time to see if these guys will repent. And each king after king is just refusing to listen. Uh, when we go to Jeremiah chapter 29, we see here another prophecy. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom, ne whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. I'm going to skip down a couple verses. Verse 4 tells us, Thus saith the Lord of, of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to, your, to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there, and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace." For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years have been accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, of the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into this, into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. So here we see that there's a message of hope. So Jeremiah didn't always talk about a message of doom and gloom, but here he preaches a message of hope. And one of the things that he was saying here is that they, they were not to be discouraged. They were not to, to despair and just give up and say, oh, we're dead we're, and, and, and we're goners. God says, okay, multiply, uh, take wives, take husbands. And when you multiply, know that I'm going to bring the next generation uh, back where I, where I have taken you all out of. And so God promises here to restore them to the land. So even though the Babylonians were able to take them captive, God pretty much promises here that this would not be permanent. So he says that the captivity would last 70 years. So it wasn't going to be forever, but it would last 70 years. And then he says to them, I know the thoughts that I think to you toward you. Thoughts of peace, to bring you an expected end. So God's mission here wasn't to destroy them, wasn't to feed them to the wolves. But it was a, there was a purpose here in allowing them to go through this captivity that he might humble them and that he might show them that there are blessings in, dis, in, in obedience and there are curses in disobedience and that it's always better to obey God so that things will go well. And then he promises them that when they call upon him, he will answer them. He's, he's going to bring them into favor where they are captives. There's a purpose behind their captivity, not just for them to suffer. 
And then he warns them, though. He says, don't listen to your dreams that tell you that this isn't going to happen. Don't listen to your prophets and to your diviners that say, oh, no, something different is going to take place. Because they prophesy a lie to you. So even though there are people out there who always want to say positive things, and they think that through the power of positive speaking, that positive things are always going to happen, even when people live in disobedience. God says, don't listen to them. And we have some of that in the church today, where no matter how bad people are doing or, or, what, or what things they're, they're doing that God doesn't like, people always want to say something positive, uh, that positive things are going to happen, that God is going to bless them. But Judah had put themselves in a situation where God could not bless them. And because God could not bless them, he brought them into captivity so that he could teach them and prepare them uh, to be able to receive his blessings later on as a, uh, as a nation. And he tells that he warns them ahead of time, you know, when people come and they try to say positive things that, oh, this isn't really going to happen or, you know, God's going to deliver us no matter what, don't listen to those individuals. And maybe God's saying the same thing to some of us today where when God says in his word that we should not do certain things and people go out and do it, uh, and then people say, oh, well, you know, God is blessing you. God is, God is doing this for you, um, that we should not listen to those words because God is not going to bless us when we're in rebellion against him. And when he prophesies that, uh, you know, the end is coming and that there's going to be a judgment for people's sins, uh, he means what he says. But yet, in spite of the fact that there's a judgment, there's also hope because God's ultimate goal was to use this experience to bring them uh, back to the promised land and to use them as his witnesses and to bless them. Uh, as you're saying, uh, the, the deception and the false prophets that are out there, people mm -hmm. claiming to be apostles, people claiming to be prophets in Christian churches as well as out of Christian churches. It is important for people to want to know truth, That's to right. want to change. There's plenty of periodicals, plenty of printed material out there for a person to read. Knowledge is not just about knowledge, it's about wanting, having that mm -hmm. desire to want to learn and not to learn just to be learning, but to learn so you can make the right choices, so a person can make the right choices and live the life that the Lord wants us to live. Mm -hmm. God's people have never been the majority, and the majority on this planet has never been moral. But outside this planet, the majority is moral, and they're on God's side. I don't think I can listen. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, I want to take us to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and uh, we're going to start at verse 11, and we're going to take a look at the next king, which is uh, Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 1 and 20 years old, in other words, 21, 21 years old, when he began to reign, and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the, chiefs of, uh, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, uh, because he had com compassion on his people, and on, his, uh, and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the, his people till there was no remedy. So here we find that Zedekiah is the last king to reign and instead of listening, he won't listen to Jeremiah. Uh, he won't, uh, just to give you a context, when, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar um, had conquered and, and uh, the Babylonians had basically taken control and they had to pay all this tribute money, God warned them specifically. He said, do not rebel against the king of Babylon. This captivity is going to last for 70 years. If you obey the king of Babylon, after the 70 years, you know, you'll go free. If you don't listen, then, you know, this is going to go really bad for you. Some of you are going to die. Uh, you're not going to be able to withstand the king of Babylon because I am not going to defend you. And so, uh, if God had defended them, obviously... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar would not have been able to conquer them. But God had told them ahead of time, you're going into captivity, I'm not going to defend you. If you try to rebel against the king of Babylon, you're going to fail. And Zedekiah, for whatever reason, doesn't want to heed this warning. He's going to rebel against the king of, of, of Babylon and refuse to listen to God. 
uh, he, he continues down this path, uh, doesn't want to pay the tribute money, and he, uh, when he begins to fight, um, you know, he, he's basically smashed. Um, and in addition to Zedekiah being wicked, it's now, the wickedness has now emboldened other people to transgress God's law. So we see that the, the wickedness has gotten progressively worse since, since Josiah's time. And it, and it puts the nation of Judah in a situation where God has to act against them. And so we find here that uh, he rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and Nebuchadnezzar had even made him swear by God that he would not rebel and that he would uh, be loyal. But Zedekiah hardens his heart and he refuses to listen. And they were doing the same abominations as the heathens. So now they're, they're putting themselves in a situation where God has to act against them. Zedekiah was also known as uh, Mat uh, Mataniah, and, and he took the throne at the age of 21, being placed there by Nebuchadnezzar as a puppet king. So Nebuchadnezzar had placed him there as a puppet king, but yet he's still rebelling. And so hundreds of years after the Exodus, where God had established a covenant with them and brought them out of captivity, now God is bringing them back to captivity because of their abominations and the things that they were doing. Uh, if you take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 to 8, actually, you know, let's, let's just go there really quickly. It says, Behold, I, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is is, is in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to, your, to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which, which thine eyes have seen and lest they depart from thy heart and all the days of thy life but teach them, to thy, uh, teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Here they were commanded, they were supposed to be a light. Other nations were supposed to look at them and say, wow, this is an understanding people. Wow, God is near to them. But instead, they were rejecting God's commandments and doing quite the opposite. And instead of being a witness to people, uh, God had to make them an example um, of what not to do. And so God had to punish them. And this was a shame because, I mean, these, these, these people were designed to reflect the image of God and, and designed to teach God to the other nations and show that the false gods that they worshipped were basically nonsense. But instead, uh, he ends up having to punish his people because they won't obey him. They did all the abominations of the pagans. And so part of the problem was that they always wanted to be like the other nations. The other nations had a king, they wanted a king. All the other nations were bowing down to these gods, so then they started bowing down to the gods. Um, and, and it shows us that we, sh we have to learn how to be content not being like everybody else. God wanted them to be a peculiar people, a peculiar treasure. And he said so even in the, in the, co in the covenant. Um, and today, Christians are called upon to be a peculiar people, a holy nation. But yet sometimes we as Christians are not content with being different from everybody else. We want to do all the things that everybody else is doing. And as a result of that, um, Judah was punished. And so today the message for us is that if we try to be like the world instead of, um, you know, being in that covenant relationship with God and fulfilling our end and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us, then we can end up j punished just like Judah rather than being a light uh, to all the world. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, Judah forfeited their, their, their status as God's chosen um, when, when they when they did this rebel when they did this, these acts of rebellion, and they and God had to dismay them uh, in front of the nations instead of uplifting them so that they could be true witnesses. And so, if we today um, are not content with being peculiar, we can suffer the same fate. Now, what's interesting is that Zedekiah actually calls to Jeremiah and asks him um, what's going to happen. You know, he he seeks after Jeremiah in uh, in chapter thirty eight. And, you know, he wants to inquire as to what God says. And he tells Jeremiah basically not to hide anything uh, from him, but he wants to know the entire truth. And Jeremiah's response to him is very interesting. So we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 38 and starting at verse 14. 
And it says, Then Zedekiah the king sent, to, to, sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third en entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide, it, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, wilt thou not surely put me to death? And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth, that made, thy, that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the, go, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy, thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of, of, of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. So what's fascinating about these verses is Jeremiah's response to the king when he says, all right, I'm going to ask you something, and I don't want you to tell me uh, anything but the truth. Don't hide anything from me. Jeremiah responds to that by saying, if I tell you, you'll have me killed. And even if you didn't have me killed, if I tell you, you won't listen to me. So why do you bother to ask? Isn't it true today that people inquire of the Lord? People ask you to pray for them. People ask you, uh, well, what does the Bible say about this or that? And if you tell them, even if they don't kill you physically, they kill your reputation. Or they kill, um, you know, your, your status. Or, or, or they terminate your job. You know, they, 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 the second you tell them the truth, there's some persecution that follows. So you feel like, okay, if you really didn't want to know, why did you bother to ask me? And then in cases where they don't do those things, you give them the counsel from the Lord, and then they refuse to listen. And so Jeremiah was experiencing and seeing the hardness of Zedekiah's heart. Um, but, Ze but nevertheless, when Zedekiah asks him for the truth, uh, Jeremiah shares it with him. Jeremiah warns him. He tells him the truth, and he says to him, look, you got to go, and you got to surrender the, to the Chaldeans. you got to surrender to the prince of Babylon, and if you don't, they're going to burn the city. If you do, things will be well with us. And still, uh, Zedekiah just doesn't want to listen. He doesn't want to believe that this is what God is going to do, even though he's heard time and time again. All the evidence that Jeremiah's prophecies were, were true were staring them right in the face. But yet, because they wanted to believe another way, um, they just refused to listen. And today we have the same thing. Because we see in the Bible how when people practice the abominations uh, that the Old Testament lists, uh, that God is going to bring them into judgment for all these things. And when you tell people that we shouldn't do these things because God will bring the work into judgment, people say, oh, no, 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 God will accept me just the way I am. God, no, 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 if, if you're going to heaven, I'm going to heaven. God wouldn't exclude me if he's really a God of love. And so people make excuses uh, for sin and refuse to repent, and they want to believe that God is going to save them in their sin instead of from their sin. So we have the same kind of hardness of heart as Zedekiah, and sometimes it's even the church leaders that are doing this stuff. So anyway, uh, Zedekiah refuses to listen, and as we look at uh, verses, uh, verse 19, it says, And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. So here, Je uh, Zedekiah was looking around, and he was looking for excuses why he couldn't do what God said to do. So he says he's afraid of the Jews that have defected to the Chaldeans, uh, that they're going to deliver them, and, and, and that they will kill him. But, Ze but Jeremiah says, no, that's not what God has purposed for you. All you have to do is submit to the king of Babylon, and things will be well with you. And Zedekiah instead tries to find all kinds of reasons why he can't do that. Sometimes we do the same thing. God tells us to do something. For example, he tells us to keep the Sabbath, and we find all kinds of reasons why we need to go to work and why, you know, things will not be well with us if we obey God. So we got to do these things that we got to do because uh, we don't trust God enough to bless us when we, when we, when we step out in faith. Um, and if it's not that, you know, it's something else. You know, God tells us uh, not to marry certain types of people, you know, not to marry somebody and be unequally yoked, and we do it, and we expect that God is going to bless us uh, when instead... Uh, the things that ends up being a snare to us. So in all kinds of ways, in all different kinds of scenarios, we find reasons to disobey God and think that we have to do what we want to do and God will somehow bless us 
instead of doing what God wants us to do, we find every reason not to do it. And so uh, we find that um, Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon, and he trusted in an alliance with the Egyptians, but unfortunately uh, Nebuchadnezzar was victorious against uh, Pharaoh's army in 597, and this defeat permanently sealed the fate of Jerusalem and the nation. So despite the fact that God had warned them ahead of time, don't trust in your league with the Egyptians, surrender to the king of Babylon, things will be well with you, they looked at their, they, they, they used their own human reasoning to justify their actions and uh, made a plan based on what they thought would be the right thing to do. And today it's kind of the same thing with us because a lot of times we use our human eyesight. We look at things from a human perspective instead of trusting in God's word. And so the city uh, was burned and destroyed. Uh, but in spite of that, after 70 years, God brought them from their captivity. And he promises them in Jeremiah chapter 23 that he would bring forth a righteous shepherd, a king who would care for them and work righteousness. So I want, this is the last text that I want to go to. So Jeremiah chapter 23, and we're looking at uh, verses 2 to 8. And this is uh, what I think I will end the study with. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the, all the countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them with, uh, which, will, which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that, I, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, which brought, up the, which, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, and from all the countries whither I have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. So here Jeremiah gives them a message of hope, that there would be a king, and we know that that king is Jesus, who would rule in righteousness, who would cause the people to dwell safely, um, who would execute judgment and justice in the earth. So God would set up a righteous king, and uh, if you read the prophecies of Daniel, you know how um, God sets up, after the fourth empire, God sets up, sets up a, a kingdom and a king that will never be destroyed, that will never, that there will never be an end to his reign. And so he promises that even though they're in captivity for 70 years, this is not the end of the story. Uh, God is going to yet work through these people and he's going to set up his, his, his everlasting king and his everlasting kingdom and reign in righteousness. So they're going to yet be witnesses to the world. And so that's what Jesus came to do. He, he set up an everlasting kingdom. And when he returns again, he will reign forever and ever. And in justice and equity. So <clears throat> here we see that the prophets uh, prophesied that there would be uh, captivity. But at the same time, there was also a message of hope. And that hope still stands for us today because we have the opportunity to be part of that everlasting kingdom. Um, so if we would obey God's word and live by what he teaches us and not oppress the poor, but give to the needy, give to those who are poor, uh, take care of those who are um, in bad situations, then we can know God and be part of that kingdom. But if we rebel like the children of Israel did in, in those times, then it won't be well with us. And God has shown us numerous examples in Scripture uh, that show us that obedience has many blessings and rebellion has many curses. And so if we would obey, just think about how the things that are going wrong in our lives or the things that, uh, that challenge us, uh, maybe the things that God is using to show us how it would be that much better if we would only obey him. So uh, we, there's so much more that we can get into with the five kings of Judah, but we've uh, run out of time for tonight. Um... So we're going to close with a word of prayer, and I just want to encourage you, who, uh, as you guys are listening in, that uh, if you haven't given God your whole heart, do that. Because 
and obedience is the only surety that we have uh, that things will go well. Uh, and disobedience ensures that just uh, judgment is going to come upon us. Um, and God has promised here that he's going to set up an everlasting kingdom that will reign forever. And if you want to be part of that kingdom, then you have to know God. And if you're doing the things that show that you don't know God, then you may be in need of repentance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to know you by doing that which is right. Help us, Father, not to harden our, not to harden our hearts as uh, many of the kings of Judah and Israel did, but help us, Lord, to be willing to obey. We pray that you would guide and bless us, Lord, because you have promised in your word that you know the thoughts that you think toward us to bring us to an expected end. And so, Lord, we ask you to bring us to that end. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to your will. We pray that you would guide and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming, everyone. Good night.